Apache Apex is a stream processing platform, actually, and so uh, maybe uh, first clarification regarding uh, what is the ETL doing in the title, right? So ETL is um, something that extracts data, does transformation on the data, and then loads data somewhere, right? And this is very broad, actually. It applies to simply uh, mirroring data from one database to another, uh, but the transformations can be also very complex. And uh, this is the type of use case that I'm going to talk about here. So it's not a simple um, move data from A to B, but actually take the data from somewhere, then does some, do some more processing with it, and in this case, actually not load it into a target uh, environment, but uh, use the data directly for visualization in a front end. Um, so where does Apex fit in? Uh, you can see here that uh, you have sources of events, uh, continuous uh, streams of data, mobile devices, logs, sensors, and so on. Uh, you have um, systems that uh, transport the data um, and uh, Kafka is the most prominent one, store and uh, also transport the data. Uh, there are other message uh, queuing systems, and those are the most common sources for stream data applications. And then um, you want to process the data, and uh, there are several options out there. We just heard a presentation about Spark. Um, there are other frameworks out there, Storm, Flink, um, and so on, and uh, really uh, many choices uh, just in the Apache um, Software Foundation alone. So Apex is um, a native uh, stream processing engine and um, a framework too. Uh, it has APIs, it has a library, and it uh, runs on clusters. So right now it's a Hadoop-based um, um, system. That means it requires uh, Yarn, uh, Hadoop Yarn, as a resource manager, just to get the compute resources. Um, it is also using HDFS for some uh, storage needs. But uh, the um, platform itself, uh, the streaming of the data between different processes, that is a part of Apache Apex. And uh, you can define your pipelines as directed acyclic graph. And that means you can uh, take these smaller building blocks that we call operators and arrange them in various ways. And here you see a simple sequence, but most applications wouldn't be that simple that you build with Apex. They would contain branches and joins and uh, to uh, express more complex logic. Uh, then. The API, there is a lower level um, DAG API. In case you are fam familiar with Storm, you compose. You take uh, building blocks and you connect them with streams. And then the other style of API that you find in uh, Spark, for example, is declarative API. It's a fluent style API. You would do your chain, different calls, and you define implicitly that a DAG. A DAG representation is present anyways um, in those systems. It's just uh, the style of declaration that is different, and different style of API is actually uh, preferred for different type of use cases and users as well. Um, Apex is also Java-based, um, but uh, the um, first uh, iteration of um, allowing or um, supporting SQL um, has also uh, come in in the last year, and that's uh, based on uh, Apache CalSight. So the operator library is pretty comprehensive. It covers the connectors for the systems that you see here uh, and more of, uh, of those. And um, just like you need a, connect, a connector to um, read data or to write out data, read from sources, write to things, um, what you really need then to express what you wanted to do are transformations. So, and uh, some of those transformations are, of course, also built into the library. Um, most of the time, um, data comes from a streaming source or from files, which is also very common, and then it goes into um, databases, and those are the results. And they are stored in databases for downstream uh, pipelines. Uh, more and more, though, we see patterns uh, where you have uh, sm uh, smaller pipelines or microservices, and they are connected with Kafka queues, for example, or uh, what I believe will also happen more and more, and you hear um, this mentioned in the last year or so, um, queryable state, um, stream processor as a database, there are various names for uh, those things, but the idea is that you have a stateful platform, uh, the memory that you already have allocated to that platform can hold data, and if you can get the data from there and use it uh, for visualization directly, that's uh, also a nice uh, idea. So the use case that I want to talk about is uh, from online advertising, um, collection of impression and click data, 
and then aggregation of the data and making it available for users to users uh, through a dashboard. And that is exactly the case that I just mentioned, where the data is not first written into a database, but it's a real-time dashboard where the user wants to see the data basically as it's being computed. Um, the reason why such system is needed in um, attack the round trip time from when an event occurs in the front end until a business user has insight in com campaign performance is critical. So this is not milliseconds, but it's, it should be fast. Uh, it shouldn't take five hours, which the system took when it was implemented as a batch pipeline first. So there are several components um, of the system that the user or the, the company has implemented. Uh, the first part, uh, which is the focus here, is the real-time reporting. Get the streams, capture the streams, do aggregation, uh, have the data for time series, and have it available for, uh, for real-time reporting or monitoring. Uh, monitoring also uh, to, um, to define alerts, um, that is another um, use case. Uh, then also for the real-time learning to take um, the data that is uh, being aggregated and computed and feed it back into uh, the machine learning. Um, and uh, the final part, and that's um, the most important part, is actually to be able to take the data back into the allocation engine, uh, which is uh, where the decision is made which um, ad will show up on which website. And uh, that, of course, affects um, the um, bottom line of the uh, business, um, what, uh, wh what we bid for and how much we bid for, right? So the um, transition from the batch to the full streaming was done in stages. And that was because um, not everything could be changed uh, at one time. Uh, the first uh, cut was to leave the E part of the ETL there as it is. That means uh, the data comes from files and just change the uh, transformation part. So transformation part means remove uh, MapReduce jobs um, that are in, defined in, uh, with, with orchestration, chain together multiple MapReduce jobs and other things, uh, take that away plus the part that loads the data finally into a database and replace that with uh, the um, processing in Apex. So that is the middle part that took it to 20 minutes, which is still a lot of time, right? 20 minutes, but it's better than five hours. Uh, when you think of a typical day, let's take a, a busy shopping day, right? When you know something within 20 minutes isn't uh, doing that well, I can still make a change and uh, rest of the day might be better. But if I know only after five hours that things are not going so well, then probably um, the peak shopping day is sort of wasted <laughs> for that particular com campaign. Um, nevertheless, that was an intermediate step. It brought the better transform, it brought the uh, dashboard already with the real-time reporting, but it wasn't end-to-end -end streaming yet, and that was really the goal. So the end-to-end -end streaming required then to take out this extract thing that was there that would take data actually from a stream, because it occurs as a stream, the clicks and the impressions, that's a stream that, that you have naturally. But uh, <laughs> what had to be done to make it work earlier with the batch system is to chop that stream into files. The files that are, I think it was 15 minutes worth each, each, in 15 minutes it was chopped off, stored into S3 and then loaded from there. So that had to go, go away and the stream had to be captured directly and fed into the stream processing pipeline. So here, this was the um, first part, and you see there's no connection between the front end. Um, these are the ad servers on the left side, then the data through REST proxy pushed into Kafka clusters, and it's geo-distributed. It's um, in all regions of the world. They have, uh, had data, have data centers uh, with those Kafka clusters, and then no link between the Kafka cluster and uh, the Apex the stream processing pipeline, and that's because um, the link wasn't there. The link was really the chopping of files and the batching. So I think they used Kamu, and then Kamu would dump it into, or it would go into a MapReduce job, and the MapReduce job would dump it into S3. And once it's in S3, there's a directory scanner running and picks up the files as soon as they show up. They will be processed, and they will be turned back into a stream. Right? That's the irony. And, uh, but uh, here you can see the processing, what happens. The file reader, then the file reader will, after the file reader, some decompress and parsing will happen, some filtering, uh, pre-aggregation, uh, shuffle, 
uh, finally, the um, uh, full aggregation uh, of the partial aggregates and the in-memory store. And from the in-memory store, uh, the results can be accessed uh, f to the front end. So this mid box that is labeled middleware is a, is a front end server. Uh, that uh, has a HTTP interface for the dashboard, um, and uh, the backend is really Kafka in this case. Uh, when when you see a widget on the screen, and this will be the this year, I show what the end result is first before I keep on talking about it. So you have this dashboard. You can see time series. You can see top end lists of uh, the data that you're interested in. You can filter, and you can also define time um, time ranges, right? So when a user goes here and uh, opens a dashboard for a particular combination of keys, then uh, a query will automatically be placed uh, into this um, Kafka uh, topic, and uh, it will um, be received like any other data from Kafka by the Apex application, and it's a pops-up mechanism. Uh, so somebody registers interest for a particular data point or for time range and key combination, and everybody could look at different things at the same time. Uh, and this um, um, dimension store operator keeps track of it and sends periodically the responses. And there's a keep alive on it, so if the browser gets closed and the user goes away or just closes the laptop, that we don't do unnecessary work, it will just stop after some time with a countdown. Uh, but this is how we can process the queries um, pretty fast. And uh, it may look very complicated. Um, well, it has to go through many hops, front-end server, Kafka, and then into Apex, out of Apex, back through Kafka, back into front-end server. But the entire round trip actually is only like 50 milliseconds. And uh, the benefit is that you get to see the data immediately. So once there is a change here in that in-memory state, which happens all the time, impressions, new clicks, they're getting aggregated. So within, sec within a second or so, you can see changes right on the front end. And you get this nice um, uh, feedback loop uh, working. So the second uh, phase was uh, move away from S3 and take Kafka right now. Consume the Kafka topics directly. Why was this not done in the first part? Uh, it actually, there were challenges, right? First of all, at that point, this was in 2014, uh, so it's a, it was a while ago. The, uh, there was work that needed to be done on the Kafka connector in Apex to, to make it uh, read from multiple clusters, because there are multiple Kafka clusters, and we don't want to waste resources by having a set of connectors and partitions for each of the Kafka clusters, because they have peak times at different days in the world. When people sleep in Asia, they are awake in, uh, in the US, and they were interested in even resource utilization rather than allocating extra. So that support had to be added. And uh, this was also Kafka 0.8 still, right? 0.8. And uh, they also had challenges uh, with the stability of the Kafka cluster. So it was tricky because when we go in here, this potentially affects the ad servers. If they cannot push the data out anymore uh, and there's a backlog, then it's not a good situation because the real, the real work that they do is serving ads, not uh, to produce logs for uh, data aggregation, which is very important, but it cannot disturb the primary function. So uh, f the switch took a bit longer and uh, happened slower, but the rest of the pipeline remained the same. Right? And then, finally, we got rid of S3, and everything is Kafka-based, and uh, we got this nice end-to-end -end, uh, streaming uh, pipeline. Um, also, some interesting learning was on Amazon unpredictable behavior, um, at least at that time, with network performance, uh, which really showed up. Uh, it's a shared environment, really. Yes, Yarn controls. Uh, Yarn will allocate CPU and will allocate memory, and that's all good. But the network, um, we saw really surprising things happen. That uh, later, when, this, um, when some of these things were moved to on-prem, they magically disappeared. So I showed the dashboard already how that looks like, and here's some more detail about the transformation pipeline. So data coming in from Kafka. Um, for efficiency, multiple log entries are actually batched together, combined together, and compressed uh, into one Kafka message. So that needs to be unwrapped on this side here, so de decompress, parse, split. And uh, then uh, enrichment uh, to inject additional data from lookup source into the data tuples and uh, transformation. And then the aggregation, finally. Um, Pre-aggregation to shrink as much data as possible while it's in this parallel pipeline. 
I show three here, but there, I think in the final configuration there were 64 parallel pipes. So we try to do as much as we can in this uh, fused or chained uh, pipeline uh, before we have to hit a first shuffle, because the shuffle is expensive. Everything has to, move to, uh, has to, has to be moved over the network. Uh, so the shuffle happens after pre-aggregation, and then uh, we have key data. So everything that belongs to one key goes to one store. I show one store. This, uh, actually, there are many of those. There are 32 partitions. There are 64 of these ingest and pre-aggregate pipes, and there are 32 uh, stores. And yes, I already um, explained what this here is. The visualization, the front-end server uh, that is interacting with Kafka queue to push uh, queries in and re retrieve results. So what is the aggregation doing? Um, Think of it as um, when you have a data warehouse, you might know fact tables and dimension tables and uh, th those type of things, right? Uh, it really is a matter of defining certain key combinations that we want to pre-compute uh, for the reporting. That means we don't go to a relational database and um, do a giant join over many, many rows of source data. The impressions and the clicks are not stored here, right? We are just storing aggregates. The data is really reduced a lot. Uh, if, the, if the input is 450,000K um, events per second, then the updates here or, or the data that is being stored here is much less, just the aggregates, not the source data. So we have these different uh, dimension combinations. Uh, for example, one is here, time is implicit based on the timestamp. Then we have time and advertiser. Those are the yellow columns. Then we have time and location. And we have... Uh, time, advertiser, and location. Those are the combinations. This is just an example, of course. There are also different time buckets that are being computed, not just hours, there are minutes, and uh, there are days, and, and so on. So you got all these things, uh, basically, you shown here as a flat list. And actually, in memory, it looks like that. Uh, the in-memory store, think of it like a hash table. Hash table with composite keys. And uh, when a lookup has to happen, we know the time range. We know exactly for which um, time bucket to look for. The keys will tell us, let's say we are looking for subway. We will have that key, and we will have a location, maybe, or maybe not. Uh, the point is, we know these are just lookups uh, in the hash table. When a new event comes in, we know what we have to update. Uh, so we know the advertiser, we know the location, we know the time, and then it's a matter of updating the metrics uh, that are the blue columns. And then these are available for reporting. There's no computation that needs to be done when the data is retrieved into the front end. So scale, six geographically distributed data centers. The, all the systems, they collect a lot of stuff, a lot of data, 10 petabytes of data. What is more interesting here is 50 terabytes of data that move um, in, in a day. And uh, those are about 40 billion ad impressions and 350 billion, uh, 350 billion bits. The, the, they collect the individual bits, right, to analyze those two. And then average uh, data flow uh, of uh, translates to 450k events per second. And I said this is handled with 64 parallel partitions to do the Kafka read, decompress, filter, enrich, pre-aggregate. And then 32 of those store, um, store instances that, they, that just keep the data in memory. So when I say keep data in memory, it's not uh, just leave it there and, um, and, and it's good. Of course, things can fail, right? Process can go down. This is continuous processing system, continuous operator model. So the data has to be there when it fails. So the data is checkpointed. It's saved periodically. But it's after the... Um, after the aggregation, it's small enough to actually do that. Um, while with the source data, it would be very difficult. Um, a lot of storage systems, they max out with five-digit throughput numbers, and uh, this should scale, right? And in this case, there's no need to save all the source data. And if, if there was, then they are already saved. They are in the Kafka topic. We don't need a database for that. Uh, total memory consumption is uh, 1.2 terabyte for the Apex pipeline. So different processes that contain those building blocks, those operators, distributed over the cluster. And the total memory that those take up is 1.2 terabyte in this case. So why was Apex used for this? It's 
providing state management and fault tolerance, which is ex needed for exactly this function to serve the data out of memory. Um, uh, exactly one's result semantics that we don't double count since money is involved here. It's uh, kind of important. Um, it provides checkpointing, windowing. You can do processing based on event time. It's, uh, the computations need to be done based on the timestamps that are there in the source events. They need to go to the right time buckets. If I run the same computation tomorrow again, I have to end up with the same result. So that's event time processing. Then um, recovery, fine-grained recovery. Um, you can have an SLA because of the, uh, way, of the way the recovery work and how you can parallelize the processing. If you use it for speculative execution, for example, not applicable here, but you can do that with Apex. But then uh, the option to do the queryable state. To do queryable state, you need the data in, in memory and accessible uh, directly, right? So you can do it with a stateful stream processor only. Um, processing based on event time. I mentioned that it's native streaming. With native streaming, you can do low latency processing, no micro patching, no unnecessary delay, unless you have blocking operations. But uh, in this case, nothing is blocking. Time buckets are updated as the data comes in. And the, um, the results, even the in, in the, as, the, as the aggregates are being computed, you can see the changes in the dashboard. It's constantly changing. That was the requirement here. Um, it's pipeline processing, so the data moves through the pipeline. It's not the processing doesn't move it to where the data is, but it's the opposite. The data moves through the pipeline, and because this is done in a streaming way, there are no spikes, uh, read spikes, write spikes, and so on. It's a continuous flow, nicely uh, evens out the resource consumption. Um, it's scalable. You can add more processes to a Hadoop Yarn cluster, uh, and they could be used by Apex, and that can also be done dynamically. Um, Apex lets you do it. And then it has the uh, library of connectors. Many of the things that I talked about here, when three years ago, they, they were not there. Um, some of the things were actually built um, out of learning from, from that use case. The connectors, some of the, the fi file readers, and so they, they, they were improved a lot. Uh, but uh, the um, basic ideas, they basically, they are reflected also in ready-to-use building blocks that you find today in the library. So this is the library, some categories, connectors for messaging, Kafka, and so on. Uh, file, read, file system in and out, file reading, file writing, those are the common, very common things that people need and do. Uh, also database, reading database, writing database, um, some other connectors, NoSQL, of course and then the transformations. So stateless transformations, simple things that you would also know from ETL tools, like filters and all of those things, parsers and so on, uh, but then also the things that require a stateful platform, right? And uh, state management and fault tolerance, uh, windowing, um, the accumulations, the triggering, watermarks, and so on. So the remaining time I want to use to um, uh, just uh, mention a few things or show how you could build something like this yourself with Apex, some of the components, because this was really a use case, a, a case study, what a customer did, the dashboard was proprietary. Um, so let's get uh, to some of the details, uh, how you would do it uh, if you were using Apex. So I picked something that is easy to understand for everyone because it's real time. Um, consuming tweets from uh, the, the Twitter developer API. Right? You, you can tap into that API, you can uh, create a developer account, and you can get 1% of the tweet stream for free. So you can write your own application, and you can do some look at the tweets, do some analysis, and it's a, it's a fun project. So um, this um, particular um, application does two things. It computes the top uh, hashtags of tweets over a five-minute window. And in the other branch, it um, computes the, uh, some counts for the tweets. So on the top, you see the top N. Uh, it extracts hashtags first, then count by key, then uh, top N, um, and then a conversion that is just necessary to reuse another operator that is the snapshot server, which is the piece that enables the queryable state uh, in Apex. Um, those two are windowed operations. So count by key is a window operation and top N too. Count by key is a keyed windowed operation and top N is 
you need, all the, need to see all the keys to decide which one are the top words, right? And uh, in the other branch, you have timestamp assignment, then we, we um, compute counts. Uh, just, three stats, just three stats is a simple example. Total counts in a window, uh, total number of um, total tweets in a window, total uh, tweets with hashtags, and total tweets with URLs. So three metrics we get there. And then we output those as time series uh, to a WebSocket operator. And in the end, after the WebSocket, there is a PubSub server. So in, if you build your own system, you would probably use Kafka. In this case, I'm using a simple WebSocket server that is connecting a HTTP on one side and WebSocket on the other side to tap in the visualization. And the visualization is uh, done with Grafana. Grafana is actually very nice for such things. It's fast uh, to set up something. And it was made for time series, for monitoring and time series. And it's really easy to visualize such data. And you can use it for tabular data, too. And so the source code of the application, you can find it here. I will share the slides after the talk. The end product will be this simple dashboard. So on the top, you see the top hashtags. Um, you see on the left side the, uh, um, the hashtags, on the right side the counts. And this extra column is just there so that I can sort it in Grafana. That's really the only reason why this label column is here. And then the lower panel, you see time series. And what you will see later when I run it, you will see that the last, these are minute, minute intervals. You will, um, or 30, yeah, these are minute intervals, and you will see that the last interval already, the, la the last minute will always update, because that's infl basically under computation. But we, we vi visualize it just as in the previous case. We visualize the data as it's being computed. So you see the changes. Okay, so. In terms of code, um, this is how it would look like. You have a window operator in the Apex library, and then you set all the different options that you need on that window operator. You tell it how large the window should be. That is happening here. It's a five-minute window. Um, you also set, you have to define in this case that you want to emit results before the window is complete. We do not want to know after five minutes of what it was, but we want to know immediately and we want to see the changes for the visualization. So after is a count-based trigger. After every 25 changes, it will emit the intermediate result and it will keep on accumulating. That's what this option means. Um, this actually follows closely how the beam um, model uh, is defined in terms of windowing. So I will not go into details here, but this is where you would find more information, what, what these things are and why, why, why they are uh, useful. And then the second um, windowed operation is the top end. It gets all the key, key um, uh, and count pairs and uh, emits the top end, top 10. So the next thing is then we have, the count, we have counted, we have the top end. The data goes into the snapshot uh, server operator, and the snapshot server operator's job is to get the query and then to emit the result. And this result operator is just a WebSocket sync. That could be WebSocket sync, that could be Kafka sync, it could be any sync uh, that uh, can talk to the, in this case, it's WebSocket because this is the PubSub mechanism that is used in this, uh, in this small example. WebSocket to HTTP, and then Grafana on the other end. Grafana continuously pulls. I had that on the screen when I show it again. Look on the upper right corner, you see one second refresh. So it continuously will hit this PubSub server and will get the latest data. Um, if you have something that is, of course, push-based, you could do that too in different client, but this is how Grafana works. The uh, Grafana data source uh, adapter and the PubSub server, they are here in GitHub. Too. You can look in at that. So the queryable state part, so we instantiate the snapshot server, and then we instantiate the WebSocket output operator. We need to tell the WebSocket op op output operator where the address is of the snapshot server. That's a configuration that needs to happen. We also need to tell the snapshot uh, server what the schema is. So Remember, upstream was computation of hashtag count and then this extra um, label column. So we need to tell it those are the fields that are available in the incoming data stream. And then the query will say which fields we want. In this case, both are the same, but uh, they could be different. 
So I will, I have recorded uh, the steps of just bringing up the different bits and pieces. So this is launching the Apex application. This is not running on the cluster, it's running as a, with the unit test driver locally. So you see these exceptions rolling by. This is because it cannot connect to the PubSub server yet. So uh, it fails to connect to that address. So the PubSub server, um, after it started, we will see those go away, the exceptions, and we will see tweets being processed. OK, so there's some extra logging here that shows. You see there are not many tweets, right? It's just that it was just running on the laptop. Um, and there aren't also many tweets to consume from the API. But you can imagine any other data source that produces more data, like the attack use case. So here, this is just a test with curl to hit the HD, with HTTP. Now the PubSub server. The PubSub server receives the data from the application with WebSocket. We can use curl to check whether the data is available. Now we will start the Grafana um, adapter. And that will now talk to the WebSocket um, or to the um, PubSub server and do what we did manually with curl before. It will put, pull the data from there. And then you can see in the uh, front end uh, the data updating. Right? You probably see more change on the button panel, the uh, top text, they change slower. But you see the last two intervals are changing. It's gonna, I think it's going to go back there. This was just a show. So the multiple components, right? There's the Apex application that would normally run on a cluster, in this case run as a inside a JUnit driver in embedded mode. There's that pops up mechanism uh, that um, provides an endpoint that uh, we can talk to from Grafana, and then the Grafana uh, sync. And then here you see now the updates happening as the data is being computed. Right? It's always the last two intervals that change, and then they will be static. So that's the way how you can do uh, time, time series computation and aggregation and visualization with um, APEX. So APEX, uh, recent um, additions and roadmap quickly, what has happened over the, over the last year approximately, there's an Apex runner in Apache Beam now. Um, we added support for iterative processing. That means you can do um, machine learning uh, algorithms too. And uh, to prove that an integration was done with Apache Samoa, then the SQL support that I already mentioned, uh, the state management, incremental state management, that means stateful processing is good, but we also need to handle very cope with very large state. If historical data is involved, if you have to keep a lot, then have to have an efficient way to store that. So there's a component uh, to do that in the library. Uh, the support for control tuples uh, was also added, which enables broadcasting of tuples across partitions in a consistent way, which is needed for watermarks, but also for batch control. And then some things on the roadmap. Um, Apex is a native streaming platform, and it really started as a, with the goal of doing real-time streaming, right? But you can do batch processing too, but there are some enhancements to make this simpler from a user's perspective. Uh, then support for other cluster managers, uh, and also support for Python, because there are really a lot of people that know Python, and they want to use the libraries that are available, and they would like to be able to do that in a JVM-based environment also. So, and then a few links, and uh, a few minutes for questions. Hi, so my, my question is, uh, if you were to write this application now, would you write it in uh, native Apex or using the Beam API? Well, today I would still use the native Apex API because the runner isn't really uh, on par uh, with uh, what Apex underneath can do, right? There is still work that needs to go into the runner. Uh, but uh, what you see is uh, these things are converging, right? The beam model and the semantics, you already see them repeated in multiple, more than one stream processing framework out there, right? So the native APIs and how beam looks like, they are getting closer to each other. And I think it will happen with other features too um, that are more non-functional, right? The scalability, how the partitioning works, efficiency. So you will, as of today, and I think this is not just the case for Apex, but also for, for the other runner implementations, you will still see that the native APIs are 
give you better performance or certain things that are not exposed to Beam yet or not available to Beam yet. But I think that's probably going to change over time. So, in other words, you don't think uh, Beam is really ready for prime time? You'd, you'd be doing it on, on native and... Well, I would, I would do it, of course. I would, I would do it native because that's what I know, right? From, but from a user's perspective, um, look at your use case that you have. Uh, what is your data volume, right? Does the efficiency matter at all? Does, um, uh, it's similar to a discussion like the latency, right? We say, ooh, engine X does so and so milliseconds and the other one only seconds. Does it matter for you? That's the real question. So what kind of processing logic do you need? Um, do you really need to have a very large state? Um, it, does it matter if, if the native API is a little bit more efficient uh, in, in your case? So I, I think that's what, how I would probably approach it. I would not say completely uh, go with native API because there are the portability advantages too that uh, certain users like, right? For some users it's important, for others not your pipeline portability. If you know how to run multiple platforms uh, in, your in your operational environment, then the portability might be interesting to you, right? If you only know one thing and you already know that you're going to run Spark, right? Then, well, why not use the native Spark API? If you decided that you want to use Apex, why not use the native Apex A API? Maybe it makes certain things easier. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, the, in your worked example, you had a PubSub server, your own PubSub server. Why, why didn't you use InfluxDB? <laughs> <laughs> well, because PubSub server was already there, I, I would say, right? Uh, we have PubSub operators, yes. You can, you can use probably also Redis, right, for, for this. Uh, it's, it, it's a demo, right? So in the real production application that I talked about, it's using Kafka. And the reason why it's using Kafka is there's a Kafka cluster already. They know how to run Kafka, and Kafka is good in, in, for this. So pick, pick what is good. Uh, so Apex has the connectors to use different um, message buses, right? You can use ActiveMQ, an EJMS-based thing, RabbitMQ. So it's, it's an example. I'm not recommending you to use WebSockets. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Right, thank you, Tomas.